perfect. We were in sync on that one. It's just it's like, gonna be a great episode, guys. Just yeah. like football. This is I can feel it. This is one of the best episodes. We're still mourning the loss of Richie. Yep, Richard, we miss you. Hold on, before John takes a sip, he has never had one of these Red Bulls before, and uh, it does smell flavor. Good. What's the flavor? It's a dragon fruit green edition. Artificially flavored. Okay. Oh, moment of truth. Rate it. One out of ten. One sip. You know the rules. Five out of ten. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Man, it's not. I'll finish it. But uh, yeah, you would. The, the dragon fruit. What's going on there? What are we? It's like a grapefruit thing. I don't. I've never had dragon fruit. What's, I don't know. I don't know what dragon fruit tastes like. What I'm saying. He just loved the flavor. Yeah. I was like the flavor. It's a good flavor. It's kind of refreshing. It smells better than it tastes. Well. I'm drinking some uh, Raspberry Rage EAA Factor yeah. for everyone else. We're getting no money from Red Bull. But EAA Factor. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're getting absolutely no money from Red Bull for this. But you see what I mean by like it kind of has that like kind of sour taste at the end where it's like not too sweet. Yeah, yeah. No, I like Red Bull. I really do. Sugar-free Red Bull is one of the the best OG energy drinks of all time in my opinion. I was like, is this sugar-free? I hope not. No, that's definitely <laughs> this isn't sugar-free. sugar-free. It's delicious. Terrible. It's no Celsius, though. You guys are terrible. I'll tell you that much. Did you hear about that girl that uh, was killed by, uh, or I guess she she ended up drinking a energy drink from Panera, and then ended up dying from it due to mm-hmm. having heart issues. Allegedly, allegedly, everyone. Yeah, hopefully Panera doesn't come after you for that. Um, I, uh, I'm just giving you the news article. Allegedly. The parents, the parents sued Panera. Yeah, the parents. She sued drank. Panera. She drank the charged lemonade. It was like 300 milligrams of caffeine or something like that for the drink. She yeah. had a heart condition. And uh, she died a couple hours later. So the question really comes down to: Did they advertise that it had caffeine or not? Yeah, it's surely if they. I'm sure they did. If they have a sign, they've got to be in the clear on that one. I think I saw the sign, but it was like I don't know. It, it, it if I was you know taking my kid to Panera and he's just like, oh, dad, I want this one. Mm-hmm. I don't think I would think any extra of like, oh, this is like caffeinated or anything like that, or like that heavily caffeinated. Sure, and I'm not working for Panera, but if I had a pre-existing heart condition, I would probably check my beverages. If I had a nut allergy, I would ask, does this have nuts in it? That's kind of what I'm saying. I'm not. You know, uh, my wife has a nut allergy, and uh, that's that's unfortunate. I got her a a carrot cake for her birthday, and I was not aware it had the specific nuts in it that she was allergic to. Really? Yeah, that turned out well for me. Yeah, I bet it did. I bet it did. (laughs) Talk about things that don't belong together: carrot and cake. Carrot and cake. cake's delicious. Carrot cake is not delicious. It's it's is, it's the the less sweet cake that's that's good because it's not overly powerful. Just like this uh, energy drink. Right? Yeah, like you get you know you know you get too much frosting, you get too much Listen, sweetness. Man, too much frosting, too much frosting. That, too much sweetness. That right? exactly. Yeah, that well, has nothing to do with the cake. That's I guess that's true. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. that's true. I, I've had this conversation before. I'm not saying you're right or I'm I'm 100 percent right. I get it. Too much sweetness is the problem. Yeah, it is. But uh. I don't know. I guess it depends on the cake, to be carrot fair. Cakes are right. I've had a really good carrot cake before, and I've had just cake, carrot cake that kind of sucks. I yeah. love carrot cake. I'm a big, like, carrot, pumpkin, pump, uh, carrot cake, pumpkin pie, like, anything like I that. I take cheesecake. Cheesecake. I like cheesecake. I think uh, I think cheesecake's the, the, the king of all desserts, actually. I, I've always had a theory. I really have that cookies are wildly overrated. Yeah, cookies aren't that good. Ice cream's a little overrated. Nah, not at all. Um, Not at all. Pie is pretty overrated too. Mm. But what's, good, what's underrated though? Cake? Cake? No. Cake? I don't I'll tell you what's really overrated, and that's Ninja Creamies. Ninja no. Creamy would be great. Let's not talk about that for now. Yeah, it's these a, guys. These guys will get a Ninja Creamy for us. If one you day. were, if you were making the hierarchy though of cake, ice cream, pie, ice cream, pie, cake in order. One, two, ice three. Cream, pie, cake. I could agree with that. Yeah. Really? Ice cream number one by far. Wait, what was the fourth one? Uh, cookies. Cookies is down after. Cookies is four yeah. for everyone. Yeah, that's what I, that's, that was what but I started the conversation. The, yeah, the only the thing way. that benefits <laughs> cookies is the fact that they're they're easy to grab. Like yeah. you can't just grab a piece of cake and just shove it in your mouth, but you can grab. A oh, cookie for, just when snack. you're gaming, or yeah. like if you're you know, yeah, or if you just want to be you know, just like not a fat ass, but I'm only <laughs> gonna have one cookie, and then you yeah. have like seventeen. You know, it is what it is, but like one at a time. Or cake, it would be like slicing yourself this tiny little piece of cake. Oh, for sure. I've I have cake's a commitment. I have sisters mind. though. I'll, I've watched women go up to like slice a piece of little cake, go eat it, go sit back down, yeah, get back up, go just enjoy slice that cake. damn cake. <laughs> like, they they will not take one a piece. Big slice. I do that with cereal, but it's really only because I will overeat the shit out of cereal if I get big bowls of cereal. Cereal's delicious. I eat cereal. I eat cereal in a mug. That's how I that's how I eat it. 
Susie does that too. It's That's the best way. Well, it, you know, you use less milk, but you get better coverage. I'm a, I'm a big milk guy. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like milk, but I don't want to drink a bunch of it afterwards. Quite, so. so wait, if let's say you're going for, you finish all your cereal, there's still milk left in yeah. it. Are you putting cereal back in that milk? Absolutely. I don't, know, I don't know, man. You're in and a never ending cycle I'm of adding, madness. Then I'm adding more <laughs> milk well, to it. <laughs> the issue is at that point is like even when you add the more, more of the milk in there, it, it, it's it's a temperature thing for me because it, I like it's not as good as it yeah, once was. Yeah, it's like it's like that that crisp cold milk that's yeah. in the cereal. You take those first cold bites and you don't really realize you're losing it by the time you get to the bowl, but then you get reminded of it when you fill it up and whatnot. That's true. The coldness of the milk you can't change that, but. Hopefully, the milk has a little extra flavor I think from the first right. round of, of cereal, you know. It totally depends on the cereal, too. That's fair. It's also an unfortunate reality of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how we got if, here. If you're getting uh, – yeah, that's true. I don't know how we got here either. But if you're getting, like, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, you're in a whole different element of, like, milk thing after that's true. the cereal. Yeah, people people really love this, the milk afterwards on Cinnamon Toast Crunch. That's what I'm saying. What's your guys' favorite cereal? That's a good question. Mine is easily actually Captain Crunch with berries. Really? Um, oh, yeah, that's yeah, a good one. But that's that's just a trash cereal. Like, that's just, you know, it's not yeah. even real. Um, Cracklin' Oat Bran is probably my favorite, like... Yeah, Cracklin' Oat You put a gun to my head, good. like, that's that's one of the best cereals ever made, in my opinion. It's got yeah. nutmeg. Nutmeg. I feel like that's all you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's, mine would be the discontinued Rice Krispies Treats cereal. That would be number one in my little life. Little clumps? Yeah, the little clumps of, were... of, like... Crispy treats, but they and they were pretty crunchy too, so they were delicious. Those were Sometimes amazing. too crunchy, They're like like yeah. uh, Captain Crunch kind of problems where they just jack the roof of your mouth. Yeah, if, if your your gums are messed you up. Have a soft mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. My, my mouth is very I've, soft. I've heard that my whole life, and I started to think I was something wrong with me. Like Captain Crunch, like cuts the roof of my mouth. Like cuts it. <laughs> no, just just leaves. It, it depends on how much you're eating too. Like one bowl, no. You know, seven bowls. The same people will tell you they can't eat milk duds because they get stuck in their mouth. I'm like, I, you got bigger problems. <laughs> well, I than... just <laughs> let it let it be stuck in my mouth. I'll eat them anyway. That's what I'm saying. Is it? My kids wanted to go to see the Five Nights at Freddy's movies. I told you guys this. But How was it? We haven't seen it. Uh, no. How uh, do you guys remember? I'm sorry. I, I, I just got so caught off track on trying to find the cereal because we got caught off on cereal. <laughs> And this is my favorite cereal we used to have was, do you remember the blueberry muffin like cereal that was kind of like cinnamon toast crunch, but it was like blueberry instead? Nope. I'm afraid not. We, we had like a lot of cereals growing up. We didn't have like the, you know, the Gen Z versions of cereals. <laughs> okay. Did, you, you, <laughs> when it was like but four this was, spinoffs for everyone. But this is like when I was a kid. So like probably your prime when you guys were probably peaking in high school. Like this is... <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall I don't why any, he's laughing. I don't yeah, I don't recall any good cereals while I was peaking in high school at all. Actually, yeah. like really, <laughs> Rice Krispies treats, Golden Grams, Golden Grams. Uh, Grams. But this was never like in the overrated this, Golden Grams. This, Under over. This what? was never in the prime real estate as cereal. Okay, this was like you know you don't know, you don't know what it is though. I, that's what I'm saying. It wasn't. I don't know what it is either. You know, no, the, I got nothing, bro. Nothing. 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 It, it was in those bags. You know how they have like the boxes, and then they have the bags up top. Mm -hmm. It was in the, those here. It was like, hmm. and it only was. It was only you know maybe it was because of the the fifty third and Meridian Walmart that I shopped at as a child. Possible. It's you know? very possible. There's John, nothing wrong with bags of cereal. I never got me though. I was a I was a box kid myself. <laughs> nothing wrong with the Malto meal though. I've had some marshmallow mateys. They're good. I know what's going on. They're good. It's okay. the same thing pretty much the same thing it's the same company 95 percent of the qualities there it's like if you're gonna make if you're gonna make two different products with different names one for the cheap people in the world and one for people that want brand names that would be a great strategy and that's what they do fruitios baby fruitios <laughs> <laughs> yep there's some good ones there so were, what were those all just cinnamon, like the, cinnamon toasters were those just like all the same brand and they're just like yeah it's the same company that makes them. It's literally Malto Meal. You know, I mean, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to just put those up there and whichever ones did well, just like kick those and put funding in behind those as like the bigger brands. I wonder if that's how like the, the brands that we know and love today got started. I don't know. Maybe. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I really wouldn't. Fruit Loops are amazing. But there's no way they've been the king of cereals for, no. for that long. No, Fruit Loops aren't that good. <laughs> so, uh... Now let's get into something nutrition related because that kind of is what this podcast is about. We tend tend to forget it sometimes having so much fun talking about cereals and broken commitments towards birthday cakes and 
all that kind of stuff. Um, I do love cake. I do love cake. Don't, don't get me started again. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the topics that we've had a lot of interest in is biohacking. Okay. And I did a little bit of research myself. And what I found is this is a very broad and general topic. Yeah. Right? So just by eating things that I know work better for my specific body, that could be considered biohacking all the way up to, uh, you know, using one of the companies where I can get my genetic code, figuring out which genetic deficiencies I have, and then uh, manipulating my supplementation program according to that, or using uh, specific uh, analytical tracking gear that can either be worn or implanted into the body. So okay. it's a very vast range. And I just kind of want to know, have, do you have any experience with it or heard of it? Or, you know, where are you at on this? Well, it depends on, you know, the levels of biohacking. There is, of course, you just what you're talking about. Any sort of bodybuilding, I think, would be, you know, biohacking to some degree. Right. If you're hacking your body, you know, you're hacking your nutritional, the way you look, you're hacking the way you feel, you're hacking, you know, what, what, you know, digest better, make performs better, things like that. But to go to a high, higher level, cold plunges, red light therapy, you know, things like that. I haven't been consistent enough with any of them for the most part to really give an answer. I have a feeling they're overrated though. You know, if I were really to put my, put my finger on it, I would say that, that 99%, there might be one of the things that would really be life changing, but I just don't think that there's that much. I actually don't know a lot about it, but from what I hear about it, a lot of it's like more personalized dieting, more personalized workouts, more like the bio elements, like just for an individual, right? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I don't know. I feel like that's been a thing in sports nutrition for a long time, um, but kind of like diluting what Jared's saying, it being a little bit overrated, it's probably just a lot of things being really consistent in a diet. You know, I'm not saying there's certain foods that aren't good or bad for certain people, but I would imagine the element of consistency is probably getting the results more than the yeah, I one. Think it, right? I mean, I think it just depends. I think there's such a, a broad, you know, a, array of what we consider biohacking that it makes this conversation sure. a little more difficult because there's high level biohacking where people will, like we said, the cold plunge therapy, red light therapy, things like that. Um, I mean, of course, there's, you know, biohacking, maybe your mood or something like that. People that do these different types of you know, morning routines or something would be biohacking or the way you use the way that you sleep would be biohacking or how sure. you do it. I know a guy that, that had uh, sheets that were supposed to ground you while you slept. So it was like you're sleeping on the ground and it was supposed to, uh, you know, transfer the, the ions from your body to the ground and vice versa or whatever it was, some of the, yeah. uh, you know, and grounding, I guess could be, you know, some form of biohacking. I've, there's one, one guy that I've, you know, watched his videos on TikTok quite a bit and his main ones seem to be breath work. Um, cold plunges, uh, early morning sunlight and grounding seems to be the four things he thinks are the most important. He also offers a genetic test where you can send your, your saliva in or whatever it is. And they'll tell you like what genetic mutations you have, right, things like that. I don't right. know if it's DNA, but some sort of a genetic mutations where they tell yeah. you like you're, you have this one genetic mutation, which means that you don't process folic acid very well, you know, or something. The guy's name is Gary Brecken. Right. right. And, uh, is that the same guy's? The Dana White guy? Yeah, it's the Dana. He talked to Dana White. Okay, gotcha. So how much of this, you know, how much of this really is a big deal? Like it, it really comes down to how much of your life do you have in a row already? You know, for the most part, like you should biohack your sleep before you biohack anything else. That's probably the number one thing. If you could do anything and put your effort into it, just get more, more sleep or, that, that's, or sleep yeah. more efficiently. Right. And so sleep's point. probably number one. And then you have exercise being, you know, another important one, moving, you know, mobility, things like that, gaining muscle. That's, that would be the next thing. And then you have, of course, nutrition as right. well. And just, you know, finding something that builds muscle, finding something that makes you feel good, digests well, things like that. Once you have those under control, then I think you get into these this next realm. You get into the cold plunge. You get into the, you know, the morning sunlight or the red sure. light. You get into the grounding. You get into, you know, whatever. What was the other one I said? Um, Breath work. Breath, yeah. Breath, yeah. yeah. So I'm sure all of them, all of them have a difference. And of course, anybody that you talk to in any of these, like cold plunges, you'll find a cold, cold plunge zealot, you know, that's like, man, cold plunging changed my life. Right. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's life changing, yeah. but then you get the same thing with people that uh, do breath work, you know, breath work changed my life or something like that. And so you have a, a vast array of, of all these different things. I think it comes down to 
you know, what is, what's worth it and what's the, what's the results you're looking for. Cause it's easy to start seeing all of these different things that you have to do and try to design your life to be this life of biohacking and self-improvement and things like that. Like sure. I saw a list of a girl the other day on Instagram and it was like, here's my, all of my habits that I'm trying to implement right now. And it's like, you know, meditate and, you know, gratitude journal and, you know, do this, you know, first thing in the morning and do this, you know, and that kind of thing. I'm like, and how many different things are you going to do before, yeah. you know, it's going to, you don't have to do all of no, them. It's, it can be exhausting. And yeah. It leads to all or nothing mindset that we've talked about. I know oh, it's, it's exhausting for sure. Cause it's, it's all, it's all over Instagram, you know, it's all over. And there's the entrepreneurial attitudes as well. You know, here's your morning routine. You need to do three hours before you go to work right. every morning. You need to wake up at 3 a.m. Right, up at 5. Yeah, you, have to, you need to have your cold plunge first. Then you need to get in your sauna or vice versa. Then you need to do your gratitude journal. Then you need to do your breath work. Then you need to go and ground yourself. Then you need to exercise. And then you need to have your your bulletproof coffee with, you know, a tablespoon of butter in there or something. It's just, it's endless yeah. at a certain point in time. So in my opinion, it's it really comes down to the Pareto principle, 80, the 80-20 rule. There are 20% of the things that result in 80, 80% of your, of your results. So 20% of the things you do are the most important things right. that you do. And those make the biggest change up to 80% of the quality of your life. And this is the Pareto principle is true in pretty much everything. You know, 20% of the people have 80% of the money, you know, sure. same, same kind of thing. 20% of your workout is, you know, 80% of the results. 20% of your diet is 80% of the results. Sure. That kind of thing. The other eighty percent is only responsible for twenty percent of your life, and I would say that's that's the same with with biohacking and things like that. So I would really would stress not to <laughs> like over demand yourself. There's there's a difference between somebody that needs to learn discipline, like we talked sure. about in one of our previous episodes. The people that need to learn discipline are different from the people that are disciplined and are trying to require a superhuman level out of themselves. Oh yeah. And there are a a great point. The cold plunge thing is like, you know, like you said, like if you're not getting your, the proper amount of sleep and the proper nutrition, why are you cold? I highly doubt those cold plunges are going to do that for you. They might do something. Yeah. If you're still eating like shit, why are you, you know, getting up, getting up and, you know, doing a cold plunge before you go to work is like the last thing you need to worry about, get the, get your fucking diet figured out. Stop eating donuts before you go to sleep every night. You know, that's <laughs> it, but that's the truth. Like that's, yeah. you're talking the 80, 20 rule. That is the 20% that will make a big difference. Like what you eat is a big part of that 20% and it will make a difference in how you feel, how your digestion works, your energy levels, you know, go into the bathroom, how, how easy it is, how many times you wipe with the toilet paper, all of it's related. You know, if you got a, got an endless wiper here, you know, it's just like, you know, you're not eating the stuff right. You know what I'm talking Sometimes about? Everybody knows what I'm talking marker. about. It's yeah, just, it's magic. Just, just never ending. Just keep wiping. My kid had this problem, and he's like, you know, I'm like, dude, what's taking you so long in the bathroom? He's like, oh, just I, just I wipe, and there's still more there. I'm like, Poor dude, guy. we got to get you some fiber. So I got him some fiber, and the kid drinks this little like a Metamucil kind of fiber every day, like a little teaspoon or half a teaspoon or something, and all of a sudden the bathroom bathroom solved. Poof. You know, wipes are easier, you know, going to the bathroom takes less time. Like it's just, that's, that's a life changing thing for somebody, even though that's minimal, you know, taking fiber every day or eating high fiber food, that is a life changing thing. And I would say that contributes to the, the 80% of quality of life. But, you know, we played, we played with the, the the cold plunges and things. I was never consistent enough. You know, I'm sure those guys say you got to do it for like weeks and weeks before you get a real result, but I never saw anything that really convinced me it was worth worth the I've suffering always found you know we've talked about consistency a lot here but you know the, the real reality of the situation is you usually need to see some sort of benefit kind of quick yeah i mean and you, whether you should or not it's totally a different conversation but you know to stick to things like if i hadn't you know seen a difference within like a month of myself working out i kind of wonder if i would still be working out to this that's day. true that's true it is hard to stay motivated if you're not seeing a result yeah and I'm, like i said that you probably shouldn't be that way motivation consistency those are or fickle beast to, to tame, but yeah. they really, they do. It means a lot. To yeah. Them. I mean, I think, I think there's, there's benefit to go back to it. I think there's benefit of all of these. I mean, I, you know, especially the ones I'm really curious about grounding. Grounding is, is one of those that I don't know much about. Is there an actual benefit to it? Sure. Does our body actually, you know, make some sort of connection to the ground and that's better for us. It seems like it could make sense. And a lot of us are not grounded where you're wearing shoes and things. And that's really like you you walk around outside barefoot is really not not rocket science or something. You don't have to go buy a gadget for it or something. Yeah. Um, I think that one would be one that I would be interested in. Breath work, I have a feeling there is some benefits for breath work, especially for people with anxiety, people that don't breathe properly. I think oh, everybody sure. probably could benefit from some breath work. I think that's probably beneficial as well. Cold yeah. plunge is the sexiest though, you know. 
it, one, it shows, it you, it shows your shows your shows your hardcore motherfucker. Yeah, well, you, you know, can't you post cold yourself, plunge, you know, you're like, I'm gonna sit in this fucking cold ass ice water and show you guys how badass I am. You yeah. Know? I think it's it's the best it's the best social media. If exactly. you, you're not seeing people sit there and just uh, <sighs> breathing in their on their Instagram and things like that, and you know, standing in the grass. You know, they're not showing off they're standing in the right. grass, but they are showing off the cold plunge because that's the most hardcore way to biohack yourself. So I find the the term biohacking interesting in itself. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to take this. You went from you know the the scientific approach. I'm going to take this from a uh, philosophical approach. Right? Oh yeah, let's do it. So, if you go and look at the correlation between things like cold plunges, grounding, um, red light therapy, um, there's even, like, some people suggest going and getting sunlight in your eyes in the morning, yeah. getting up and moving. Yep. These all sound like pretty primal ideas, like things that before modern society, you know, and, and the rush of the nine to five and the work and everything that we've you know, painted ourselves in this little corner that society has uh, that we were exposed to every day before all of this. So it's kind of like it's the term kind of reminds me of hacking our bodies to be okay with the way of life that we have made for ourselves and whatnot. So I think a lot of it is just thinking back to like, what can I do to I don't know. It sounds a little heavyish, but like get in touch of nature, like because everything is involving you know getting out, getting fresh air, getting sunlight in your eyes. I'm, I'm assuming the red light therapy. You, you would probably get the same. It's related to morning and evening light. There's yeah. more red light in it. Yeah, I would. I, yeah, I would assume that the sun emits the same light at different different times. You know, when we're going out and having to hunt for food, move around more, um, we're at risk every day of yeah. life and death, and, instead of being so comfortable where we are now. Yeah, I think that a lot of these things were probably built in. Yeah. But, you know, the cold the cold plunge, not so much. Maybe in the wintertime there was some cold plunge, but they weren't doing that. I have to day. jump in and go get your fish. You know, the resilience. The, the interesting part about cold plunging is there is a resilience to cold and a resilience to pain and a resilience to these, you know, discomfort and things like that. So, I, you know, I see a benefit there because if you are building a resilience against discomfort, it's like when you were a kid, you know, I'm, I'm not going to wear a jacket, mom. You know, I don't need a jacket. It's not cold now. I'm like, it's like 60 degrees. And I'm like, I better put my sweatshirt on. Mm-hmm. That resilience to cold, I think, is is one of the biggest features we see from from the aging process. You know, old people all moved to Florida for a reason. They don't like being cold. And so that's that's part of it. But, yeah, I think that you're right. There's a disconnect from our natural you know, state of being, I would say the same thing is true for food 100%. You know, to bring it back in. It's the same with food. You bring in whole food that you would normally eat, you know, that we would have, you know, as, as close to nature as possible. And I think that you notice immediately that there's some sort of, you know, benefit to your body that you feel better and your digestion's better and everything. And I think that two acts of, you know, being active, you know, and constantly doing things is something that we've obviously lost as well because we live sedentary lives and watch TV and work in, work in offices and yeah, things I like think that. That's so a huge factor. I mean, you know, Professional sitters didn't exist like ten or twenty years ago, really. Only in only in India. That's true, actually. That's That's thousands of years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't as predominant here, though. I feel like it didn't start as young. You know, I mean, the amount of desk jobs you have, Um, and for sure with the sunlight thing too. You know, D three and getting sunlight Mm -hmm. is not you know for years been known to be healthy. It's not like it cures cancer or anything, but it's beneficial for you. They used to have uh, hospitals. It used to take out people like to the top floor all the time mm-hmm. and just like have like beds up there to get people sunlight all the time because it was, it was regenerative properties almost. Yeah, you know, it, was it was one of the things that was found to, to fight against COVID-19, the, the yeah, strongest out of everything. I was just about to say is, yeah, like six high levels of High levels of D3. I think it was interesting that I think some of the problems from COVID, ultimately D3 levels were one of them. Um Obviously, activity levels that we just talked about was another one. They they told everybody to stay inside, oh, 100%, close the gyms. One hundred percent. There was there was another one that I was going to say. Oh, it was. I, I had this theory whenever I started seeing who was getting you know the most messed up from COVID, and I thought it was insulin resistance. And uh, the reason I say that is because I knew a guy that was in good shape, but he's an older guy that's definitely had. He's got money. Mm-hmm. He's got a lot of a lot of money to spend. He was in fitness. And so he's most definitely on growth hormone and mm-hmm. probably a lot of growth hormone just to stay young and feel good and stuff. And growth hormone at high levels can increase insulin resistance. Mm-hmm. And he went down, he had to get on a respirator. He was on the respirator for like a month and things mm-hmm. like that. And the other people that you saw that, that were going down were large people, large people are diabetics. Insulin, yeah. Diabetics or insulin resistant, yep. things like that. So it's very interesting. I think it was right. very much related to insulin resistance. So the f- best things they could have done during COVID would have been Get some sunlight, go exercise, eat healthy foods, 
lose some body fat, maybe even fast for a little while or go keto or something like that. Those would have immediately changed some insulin resistances for people. It's really sad too, because, you know, no one knew quote unquote to verify like what we should do. Of course. But early on, I remember like two months into it, someone was like, looks like D3 is like a pretty good way to get. (laughs) Yeah, it was early. And like you said, like, I, it's so sad that it took two, two and a half years for people to like, all right, well, we think D3 is a good option to fight COVID. I was like, yeah, dude, people are yeah. saying that right away. Um, yeah. And it's really sad that you never heard anything from the government about go get some exercise. No. I mean, anytime sickness sunlight. is going around, they know exercise boosts your immune system and makes a more resilient human being. They just didn't give a fuck. Right. They, and want, you to, you want, they want you to use their pharmaceuticals that they're in, in bed with, you know, the pharmaceutical agencies. Mm-hmm. So. It is what it is. Yeah. I, uh, they're all crooks and liars. <laughs> Fuck them. I agree. I agree. But I, I, it's crazy because we have came, we have come so far in such a small amount of time with the evolution of technology, mm-hmm. scientific and medical knowledge. But it seems like within that leap forward that we forgot to bring a lot of the core information with us that it was forgotten or it doesn't make money. Or maybe a combination of both. Um, and I think that's something that we're going to have to look at as a society moving forward. I mean, the fact that natural immunity was blatantly ignored for 18 months just in the name of selling that shot alone. Should, should, oh, that's yeah, of course tell a lot of, of course. people something. You know, that's I, of I, course I, that's money. Look at me in the face, be like, "Well, we don't know for sure about this one." So, like, what, what makes it different? Well, yeah, that that, well, we that part's obviously yet. money. But I'm talking like the sure. mass, like collective of of you know that what the average person knows. You know, it's back. Yeah, we've, the, we've become we've become more focused on convenience than anything else. I think it's really it. We like food that that tastes good and is convenient, and it's not you know what we're what we're used to, we like, you know, artificial light and watching TV, which is not great for the circadian rhythm, for melatonin production, for going to sleep, things like that, for great sleep, sleep quality. You know, we take stimulants all day and things like that, which affects sleep quality as well. I mean, there's just, it's so much convenience, I think, is really what it is. There's definitely a greed aspect to it, but they can only sell what people will buy. And people will buy it all day long when there's good tasting food that'll fuck you up and there's good you know, good drugs oh, that you yeah. can take. Fuck I, you know, people, they're only going to buy, you know, they can't, they can't force you to take them other than, other than the facts. Yeah. Know, no but. one's shoving Skittles in your mouth. Yeah, for um, sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. I, uh, I would compare this to someone like a, an athlete or someone who got famous, you know, came into money very quickly, fame, who came into money and fame very quickly, doesn't know how to handle it, stresses convenience and pleasure. And, dopamine and serotonin yeah i feel like that's where we are at as a society and i just don't know when we're gonna hit the wall because you know every every if we take this to applying it to people they always hit the wall they always recognize their mistakes and then try to change it uh for the better for the better and reach a sustainable path and i don't think our public health is on a sustainable path and i think it's going to take a really big correction to put us on a sustainable path and i just don't know where that's at Oh yeah, who knows? That's there's to correct the the medical side of America yeah, and the say, world at this point in time. Probably is probably a different podcast. An act, an act of God but, uh, is really it. What we can probably definitely say for now is that what we're doing right now is not working mm-hmm. that well. So some sort of change in the future probably needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, and it does it does shine light in, in like the biohacking thing that we're talking about though because that is a, a correction, maybe a natural correction to pharmaceuticals and the industry and the way sure. things are going that people are going so hardcore in the opposite direction of how do I improve my body without all these different drugs and, and chemicals and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, sunlight and grounding and breath work and cold, you know, not that not that magical for the most part, but it does show that there is there's a correction happening in a certain, you know, subsect of society, you know, five percent or something at the most, though. I think what that comes from, too, is uh, people feeling like they're not being heard or fully invested in, you know, they go and see a doctor with an issue, whether it be, you know, um, having chest pains or, you know, um, or I have I have an itchy scalp, or my hair is falling out, and, and just stuff that can be related back to stress or um, 
you know, factors that you maybe need some more B12 in your diet. Maybe you need more sunlight, but they just give you these uh, antidepressants and get you out of their office in 10 to 15 minutes. True. Yeah. It's, it's hard for people to find a medical professional that generally cares about them and will take time out of their day I to mean, give them the proper attention that they need. That's it's, just the way, you know, that's just modern society, though. I mean, we don't have to, you don't have to look at them now, but I mean, I remember seeing the stat about the amount of people on either on anti-anxiety medication or ADHD medication, basically just some kind of generalized thing. And it was crazy <laughs> high. I thought it was like five or 10%. And it's like, I don't, I don't no, know. There's some, there's some stat that like, you know, it's like 70% of the American population is on one pharmaceutical drug. That, that's what least, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I didn't want to pull the it's, number it's out. A crazy, it's, it's, it's a crazy number. It's always higher than I remember. I'm just like, what? Like seven, like ten point two percent of America is on anti anxiety medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude, that's wild to me, at least. Anti anxiety, like one out of ten people are getting prescribed medication. Yep, for and uh, yeah, one out, it's thirteen point two percent is on antidepressants. They're categorizing mm -hmm. them separately. Yeah, and so the ADHD, you don't have to. Yeah, I would assume line, that's another ten to fifteen percent. So you and bigger when you're younger. Yeah, I would assume you have thirty to forty percent. Of the nation's population with on antidepressants, anti-anxiety, or ADHD medication, and a lot of that, I don't know, what is it? You, you see it presenting itself in kids, and you know they say ADHD might come from, uh, you know, having your parents fight a lot as your child. So the only way to escape is being able to zone out and whatnot, and it carries as an adult, through you uh, as an older kid or adult. Some people say it's based on you know their kid having to sit in a classroom for seven hours a day when you know, that's unrealistic to have a child do. So it's, I, there's another one that's the genetic mutation thing that we were talking about. They say that they can't process folic acid is another, another theory that's out there that they can't process folic acid and folic acid actually does the opposite to them. It makes them hy hyperactive. And so the answer is to, uh, to get the version of folate methylfolate that's already been processed. And so because the, they're the methylation process is what they're missing. And so to get methylfolate and there's people that claim that just changing that one thing changes ADHD in their kid completely. So my kids have it, so I might as well just try it. It's not going to hurt them. It's just a more active form of folic acid. I think you ha you're having like conflicting uh, areas of thought, right? So you have one side thinking that, all right, obviously what we're doing now is not natural. It's having an adverse effect on us, like our stress levels, our uh, public health levels, our kids, all that. And something needs to change. And then there's another school of thought saying, okay, well, this is just a natural progression of the evolution of like humans merging and utilizing technology more. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure which side I believe because, you know, obviously you can utilize technology to help benefit yourself with obviously biohacking, uh, sure. getting as much data as you, as you can to work with and whatnot. But I don't know. We're going we're gonna to have to find a, a middle ground and it's going to have to be pretty soon on – which direction we're going. Well, the, the artificial intelligence will save us. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. So artificial intelligence will likely be the, the doctors coming up soon. I saw this, um, this lady that had a child and I don't, I don't remember exactly what the problem was, but she'd been to neurologists and specialists and doctor after doctor and nobody could figure out what was wrong with her kid. And, uh, finally, I don't know what, what prompted it, but she went to chat GPT and she typed in all of her symptoms and asked the, them to come up with a list of diagnoses, and it diagnosed it correctly. Mm -hmm. And she was like, it sounds like inflammation of the spine. And uh, so she went to the neurologist and said, this is what I want you to test for. And they tested, and sure enough, it was inflammation of the spine. And ChatGPT got it right from her just listing out the symptoms, not even body scans or anything. So there's a very cool future with, with those kind of things that will come with artificial intelligence plus you know, being able to scan your body and have a deeper knowledge and have blood tests and things like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the main focus that because that's proactive kind of holistic care. And I don't think that's where they're going to go. But there are, of course, other people. Artificial intelligence is available virtually to anybody now. I know. So any startup could come up with something where they have something like this. Where it gonna, it'll just be like everything else. They'll have to find a way to root all the money out of it first. Well, that's true. These cardiologists and these all these people in that profession. Yeah. I'm not saying they're, you know, getting filthy rich or anything, but they're not going to go out quietly. No. One of the interesting things that I don't think people know is how much, well, you know, how much sleep affects 
the way that you feel and how much, how many people have a sleeping issue that they're unaware of. Like for example, people that feel tired all the time. Um, a lot of people have sleep apnea. Like I had, I have sleep apnea and I, I gone to the doctor and I was actually just talking to him and I was like, you know, when I might, I'll be sitting at home and I'll be talking to my wife and six o'clock and my eyes will just start drifting and I'll just start going to sleep while she's talking to me. And so he gives me a few other questions and he's like, you know, do you fall asleep in the car when somebody else is driving? Yeah. Do you fall asleep during movies? Yeah, I sure do. You know, are you tired throughout the day? Yeah. You know, pretty much. He's like, you know, I'm going to get you tested for sleep apnea. And yeah. so sure enough, I had sleep apnea. It was pretty bad. And I had, uh, I had to put a CPAP on. It's the machine that blows air through, through your sure, mouth yeah. the whole night or through, through your nose the whole night. So you don't, you know, have your throat collapse, which is sleep apnea. But I would say that that is actually one of the biggest underlying things I think people should pay more attention to. And that most people that would be interested in biohacking or something like that should probably get some sort of sleep study done because any sort of snoring indicates that you have, you know, a potential risk for sleep apnea. And I was snoring like a freight train as a kid, like not even a big kid. I was, I was skinny for the most part. I was snoring like crazy. So it was, it was pretty, I had it forever. And so now I have a mouthpiece, which shoves my jaw forward while I sleep, which is really uncomfortable, but it's better than a hose that's blowing air the whole night. And it seems to do a pretty good job, but I would say biohacking, you know, paying attention to those stats, paying attention to, you know, what you could pr- fix in the medical profession, things that they missed with me, um, mm-hmm. until I finally had the right conversation was sleep and how oh, much dude, sleep affects yeah, we everything. Could, we could do a whole podcast on sleep. We won't obviously. No, we we'll boring. It's a, it's a boring but, topic. Yeah. But dude, <laughs> sleep is, I don't remember the body bill that said it, but I, I always liked it. Cause I always remembered it. Sleep is primordial. Yeah. Like it, it will, it will help so many things. I'm not, there's a reason when you're sick, you just stay in bed. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what you need. The fluids and sleeping is, is way better for you than almost anything. In and it's, and it's interesting because just in this society, like sleep is something that we obviously will sacrifice for everything else. You know, if, right. if you need to get up at 4am to go work out, well, you know, fuck your sleep, just go, go work out. And yeah, I don't know, you know? why that is like the, the one thing that constantly it's like, oh, we'll just, you know, just get up earlier. Yeah. Go to bed. Or like, it's just like, dude, no, <laughs> yeah. there's 24 hours in a day. You need to be asleep for probably seven of them for yeah. most everybody in the world. Yeah. Some people do. weigh more. Some people need nine hours of sleep. And, there's, and if you're a heavier person, if you have a big neck, if you have a lot of muscle or you have a lot of fat and you notice that you're tired throughout the day and maybe you have a headache when you wake up sometimes or you feel like you wake up in the middle of the night and your heart's racing or something like that, you probably have sleep apnea. So you should go get that checked out. And it doesn't even have to be by like a big sleep study or something. They can put an oximetry monitor on your finger to tell you how much blood oxygen you have. And you do your O2 stats while you're sleeping. And if your O2 stats drop, you know, while you're sleeping, it's an indicator of sleep apnea. So then they could go further into a test if they need to. That's a pretty big indicator. And that right there is usually enough to to get a diagnosis. According to the uh, American Medical Association, over 30 million Americans have sleep apnea. Oh, yeah. It's it's a it's a crazy thing. And I mean, and it does do a lot of it does a lot of problems. So like one of them is a blood thickness. So it can increase blood thickness because what's happening is it's your two levels are going down while you're sleeping consistently every single night. And so what your body does is it will increase hemoglobin production to carry oxygen in your body to get more efficient at it. But the more hemoglobin production you have, the thicker your blood gets. So you naturally get a thicker blood. You also get the problem of your body having to wake you up. And since it's waking you up to breathe, which might be these things that you're not really noticing when they wake you up, you're coming out of a REM sleep. You're coming out of deep sleep. So you're constantly tired. Well, then I know that fires your heart rate up, which is the number one thing of getting up to sleep and getting back to sleep. And firing your heart rate up with, especially with thick blood, your body has to try harder and so you start bringing potential heart problems into it. And so sleep apnea yep. has actually been related to heart problems as well. And so it's, it's not just a minor thing. It's something that people should, especially severe stuff, you know, people that, that burn the candle at both ends, people that have sleep apnea, any of these things, like sleep is way more important than, than whatever else you're going to do. Exactly and so, right. you know, turn the TV off an hour earlier, you know, send your kids to bed earlier, whatever it is. And get the sleep that you need. I think that's that's like if you're going to biohack, like you should make sure that sleep is like number one on all of those things. Yep. And so I wear my watch when I'm sleeping to see, you know, what my sleep's like. I don't think it's very accurate, but to be honest, but it does tell me how much I move around. And if I am moving less, ass- yeah. assumptively, I am, you know, getting better sleep. So. We should do a challenge. We should see what we can go longer without water or sleep. I that. 
Sounds like a terrible challenge. Yeah, it doesn't sound very fun. I don't know. I don't want to do that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> you do that challenge. You can do it. Let's see how you go. I think we'll time you. I don't know. I think I'd take water for I don't know, man. I think it'd be water. I think it'd be water first? Yeah, I think it's water. Hey, we could place our bets. We could... Yeah. <laughs> Team water yeah, quickly. Richie do it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Richie. <laughs> um, and this, this also kind of goes back to the sleep and, and biohacking and whatnot. How important is tracking like your sleep or your workouts or any data related to your personal health? Tracking is, I think, the most important thing that you could possibly do to know what's going on uh, with your, say, with your workouts or with your your body progress for the most part. Like a lot of people will think that they need to switch a workout up early uh, simply because they think that they're not getting progress, they're plateaued. And so a lot of people think they're plateaued and make changes to their diet, they make changes to their workout, they make changes to whatever that's going on, their supplementation. What The truth of the matter is they don't even know if they are plateaued. They have no idea because they haven't tracked anything. They haven't tracked their exercises. They haven't tracked, you know, consistent pictures of, of the way that they look. Their body weight hasn't been tracked. You know, they, they think they remember. So you go to the gym, you throw two plates on the bench press. You know, you think that's what you did last time. You don't remember exactly how many reps you got. Turns out for the last six months, you've been doing the same exact exercise yeah. with the same exact weights for six months and you haven't made any progress. And the, the reason you haven't made progress though is not because your body just stopped making progress because you didn't see that you did two plates last time sure. for 12 reps. And so this time you're going to do two plates plus the two and a halfs on each side and you're going to go up to 230 on bench press instead of 225. And then you're going to see if you can get the rep. That, yeah. that forceful progress is what it takes to actually break plateaus and get and get stronger. But most people don't even know what they're doing yeah. so because they're not tracking their workouts or tracking any of their progress or anything like that. So I think if you're serious about what you're doing, the first thing that you could do and the easiest thing you can do is write everything you do in your workouts down. Figure out if, if you're really serious about making body changes. Take pictures every week. You know, track your body weight once a week on the same day, take the pictures on the same day every week, wear the same clothes in the same sunlight at the same time of day, you know, get those kind of things. Track if you're getting stronger in your workouts, track if your body weight's going up or down, if you look fatter, if you don't look fatter, you know, things like that. Then you actually know what, if what you're doing is working. Then you can actually make an adjustment to something. But if you don't, if you don't know this stuff, you know, how are you going to adjust? You're going to just knee jerk reaction. No, today I feel fat. So people use the scale, people use the mirror Mm -hmm. for a for those things and like you're saying unless you're really checking in every day you can't even tell no especially if you're like you know if you're lifting heavy a lot of times like i mean you're gonna look you're gonna probably look and feel different but you can weigh the exact same yeah. especially you know like as a guy like lifting a lot like you could easily like your waist could get smaller and you could gain five pounds absolutely so easy like, absolutely over, over weight, course of course time the, it happens yeah yeah. I, yeah I just i just it's always i always thought that was weird when people use those as kind of gauges for things yeah how you feel is ultimately the king yeah of, you of, could track i mean you could track sleep in the same way i think after sure. a while you're going to run out of data because there's not enough data to get you have hours you could track your heart rate, you know, with a watch or something. You yeah. could track, you know, quality. They give you a quality score on your sleep or something. I don't think they're that accurate yet. I think that there's better indicators that we're going to get later on as they have these biometrics that they put on your body and things that, that'll probably tell you more about sleep. Maybe it'll be brain waves or something like that. You know, it could be anything that, that would be better. But I, that would be cool. But I think anything that you want to get better at, you have to track. I think you have to, you have to yeah. keep track of your progress. You have to keep track of how it's going. And then that's the only way you can make make an adjustment if you don't know what the result is. Yeah, if really. you don't know where you're going, you're not going to, you know, you're, you have to have a destination in mind for that. You know, even like, even if you're not going up every week, realizing that, be like, okay, why didn't I go up this week? Yeah, is you it one exercise? Sleep, or, yeah. are you, or are you just not doing something correctly? You got bad form. Yeah. Like you said, maybe you are plateaued. Maybe that's the data you needed to realize. Stop doing flat bench for a little bit. Go do dumbbell press for a yeah. month. If you come back, maybe you do. Maybe it's the exact same, but at least you know what's going on when you're tracking. If you're not tracking anything, you're literally just spinning your wheels like, no, oh, I'll just do what feels good. Yeah. How when, when, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, don't talk. Oh, so my bad. I'm my bad. I, I'm not the fitness expert here. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the thing about the tracking is there's a lot of indicators like what John was talking about is are all of the exercises plateaued or is it just one exercise that's plateaued? If it's all the exercises, then you're looking at, at, a, at a bigger problem. Beyond just the exercise, you're looking at a sleep issue, you're looking at a dietary issue, you're looking at some, if it's one exercise, maybe you just plateaued on that exercise and you just swap it out like what John was talking about. But that's where the tracking comes into place is that that kind of information is, is really helpful and, and, and really, truly 
because you don't remember as much as you think that you remember what weight you did and how many reps you did last time. If you really are doing it the right way year after year, you're not going to remember. I mean, you're just not going to pay attention anymore. So maybe, maybe in the very beginning, but how much of that has to do with a lot of these people seeing these, uh, seeing physiques of other people and not really understanding or knowing the effort that it takes to go into that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's the same idea as these guys that, um, you know, watch football or basketball. I'm like, oh, I could, I could totally have caught that ball, or I could have made that dunk. Or people that watch UFC, are like, oh, dude, I could totally kick that guy's ass. Like, yeah. it, it, I feel like there's a lot of that in fitness that isn't really considered. Is you know, oh, why don't I look like that? Like, I put in all this work, and I don't look like that guy. I think a lot of asking with people don't understand the type of effort, sacrifices, and commitment it takes to look like the physique that they're aiming towards, and also genetics, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think that what would be interesting, and I do, I do think there are people that have no idea how much work it really takes for the right physique. But the biggest, you know, the biggest thing that it takes is time more than anything else, right? So I think that there would be a lot of people that work out consistently and try to eat healthy that don't track their progress, and they're already putting in most of the effort. Like you're already doing the exercises five days a week. You know, you're already trying to eat healthy. You're limiting your cheat meals to once a week, but they don't get the results they're looking for. I think those people would be amazed that if they just tracked what they were doing, you know, had a diet plan that they ate on and tracked the workout progress, that all they needed is a small tweak on any one direction and they would start seeing the progress that they're wanting to see. They're already doing most of the effort. The effort is planning out your diet, eating according to that diet and working out. That's, that's the effort for most of these people. There's just a little bit more mental effort to track it. And most people are not willing to put that mental effort in there. Kind of like uh, making a muffin recipe, but just putting in a little too much salt, you know, everything yeah. else is there, but you just put a little too much salt. It'll so the muffins everything. taste like shit. Yeah. Yeah. It'll ruin everything for sure. So if you track what you have, you have the data necessary to make the right decisions. Even if you're doing a workout, that's not the optimal workout for you. At least, you know, if it's working or not, you know, that's, at least, you know, you, well, I was getting stronger. What happened? Yeah. You know, maybe I need to add more calories. Maybe I need to bump my protein up. Maybe I need right. to switch up my workouts. Maybe I need more sleep. You know, maybe I need an extra rest, rest day, you know, stuff like that. There's a lot of these indicators and you can track things like I used to track hunger in on a weekly basis. When I was training my clients, it was a weekly form they would fill out. What's your body weight? What are your measurements? I wanted your, your arm, your leg, your waist. And then I wanted a, a glute measurement for, for women whenever they were training with me because they tend to hold more body fat in their glutes and guys don't. And then I would ask them questions like, how was your strength this week? You know, how's your energy this week? How's your hunger this week? Because those are all indicators of what's going on. So if you're tracking things and you're like, I am getting hungrier over the course of weeks and you're, you know, starting to plateau, there's yeah. an indicator that, you know, you're hungrier for a reason. Your body's wanting more food, wanting more calories. So if your energy level is dipping and you notice that at the same time your workouts are suffering, well, now you have an energy problem. Did yeah. you go too low on your calories? Are you not getting enough sleep? Like there's just more data that's there. And I think that that's really the big key for everything. Whenever you're on any of this stuff that you're trying to do, if you, if you track what you're doing, at least you can make adjustments. 100%. People focus on like the good parts of it, but you can get just as much bad. Like you keep saying it's the data, mm -hmm. but just an adjustment, a change if you're going to kind of obsess over it in some ways you might as well obsess correctly yeah that's a, that's a good obsession if you're going to do it yeah you know be very thorough on your on your data taking taking data yeah so i think that's yeah especially in the gym it's one thing to write down everything you eat all the sleep you get but if you're if you're serious about getting bigger not doing progressive overload or not tracking things then that's a really good place to start yeah, and it's the easiest. I mean, you can do it on your phone. Yeah, they have the all these. Thing there's all phone. these workout apps where you can do it on your workout. So I'm like that. I pulled up a Google Sheet the other day, you know, just like an Excel sheet, and I'll probably change it because I don't like it. But I started tracking this new workout, and I was like, let me try this one. Usually, I just use the Apple Notes on my phone. I was about simple. to say, uh, maybe we can. Uh, I'll try to find a good free fitness app next week. Oh, uh, we'll hawk it. Yeah, or just a good a good way to put them in there. Like Apple Notes, it works just fine. Yeah. You know, not everybody has it. The Google Sheets works fine. The only thing that irritates me is how, the, how you have to click a button to edit each cell. Yeah, I know. So that's the, the only part that sucks on your phone. Yeah. So otherwise, it has, has all the information you need. It's just literally the day. Here's all my work exercises. Here's this, the weight that I used. And here's all the reps on how many sets I yeah. did. So it's literally, you know, dumbbell bench press, 70 weight times you know, 12 times eight times six. Those are the three sets of nice. 12, eight, six. Yes. Yeah. And that's it. And then I go back to it the next week and I go, oh, I did 70, 12, eight, six. 
This time, I'm going to do 75. Yeah. And I'm going to see if I can get as close to 12.86 as possible. Yeah. It may be 10, 5, 3, but that's pretty damn close. And so, and I went up 10 pounds, if you think it's five pounds in each hand. So, I went up 10 pounds with dumbbell. That's a, that's a feat. You know, now I'm up and my reps are about the same. So, now, the next week, next time I go to it, sure. I'm going to use the 75s because I got 10, 5, 3. And then, what am I going to do? I'm just going to try to get a higher rep range. So, the first sure. one, I'm going to try to get 12 to 15. The next, next set, I'm going to try and beat five. And the next set, I'm going to try and beat three. And if I do, I got stronger. And that's that's the name of the game. Yeah. It's not, yeah. not rocket science, but it does take some tracking. Yeah. So a lot of these people listen to uh, the people watching or mm-hmm. listening or however you Our listeners. Doing. Our listeners. Uh, sending questions to ask about, you know, themselves. Well, okay. we had a particular one that obviously is about themselves, but another person lies. Um, obviously a lot of us have significant others and you know, you may be fitnessly motivated or, and they may not be, and you're getting to a point where you have a certain, I guess, how do I put this? He's a physical expectation of your partner that you don't feel like they're meeting. How do you, your girlfriend's getting fat. Yeah. How do you, how do you bring up that conversation or your boyfriend yeah. or your husband you or don't. your dog? I Guys don't know, get what, fat too. Whatever, <laughs> whatever you're into. We all, we all get fat. I'm not, we're not going to talk about the end of the dogs thing. We're, just, <laughs> we're ruining the show, Gen Z. <laughs> now that's a good question though. How do you talk to your significant other? If you are, if they're, you know, they're starting to put on the pounds and they're not watching their health. And of course there's some, some key things there, especially as you get older. I mean, if you, if you are, 40s, 50s, like that's something that you need to start getting a handle on before you get older. Because I mean, bad health in your 40s, 50s, you know, just gaining weight and being overweight, it's not going to go away in your in your 60s, 70s. Like it's only going to get worse. And it's only going to create bigger problems. So it's obviously an important conversation. So if you had if you had a wife or a girlfriend or a husband or a boyfriend, whatever it is, that's putting on excess weight, you know, how would you approach the topic, John? I, I wouldn't, um, <laughs> no, if I, if I did find myself in that situation, I would tread very lightly, but I would probably put more of the emphasis on the health aspect. You think the health would convince them? I think I'm not saying anything would convince them. That's, this is the angle I you just, pay. you just go, you say, you know how your clothes don't fit anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know how That's, I had to buy a new, new, new once, wardrobe. Yeah, I'm talking, we about, don't got money for another wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how you feel so much lately. Yeah. The feeling is what I would go off of to feel better because I personally have been a little, a little fat in my days. And I can tell you 100%, you feel a lot better being an active person. You do for sure. Um, so I would go off that, the, the things you're able to accomplish during your day, the way you feel during but you're your saying, day. Do you think I'm fat? Yeah, so once again, Do I wouldn't. I wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> you just let them. You so just I let would, them keep getting larger. I, yeah, I would absolutely not. I think there's a point in time where you do have to consider the health aspect. You know, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a certain joking, group, there's a certain, really certain group is, of people yeah. that, that are into the larger, the larger people. You know, both man and female, and so they may not have a problem with the way they look. Sure, but at a certain point, they do need to say, "Hey, you know, you're going to be pre-diabetic soon if you keep getting lar- larger, and you're going to have you know heart heart problems, and you're going to have all these other other issues that are kind of come you know along with your your health yeah. being bad." And so I think that's a very a very necessary conversation. The other conversation we're talking about is obviously, you know, looks and attraction and personal preference and sure. things, which is just as important, in my opinion. Sure. You know, you should always want to so look good. So I wouldn't have this. I wouldn't have this sweet mustache if my wife didn't enjoy my sweet mustache. You know, so As that would be if she was like, "I hate your mustache." I probably, I'd probably get rid of it. So my instead, she thinks I look good, nice. guys. So the mustache is staying. Yep. I, uh, it's a tough one. She must have liked Tombstone when we watched it. <laughs> <laughs> Tombstone's a great movie. I, um, yeah, I would, uh, I would, like I said, that's a tough one, but I do think it can definitely be done. Definitely can be done. Yeah. Brock, how would you approach this? I think approaching it, you have to acknowledge your own faults first. So the other, so they that's don't a feel attacked. wise, uh, so you have to first wise, um, attack yourself and put yourself out of vulnerability saying, Hey, you know, I don't feel good about myself recently. Like, I feel like I've, I've been kind of getting, letting myself go. Can I, can I get you as a gym partner to kind of help me and push me through this journey to kind of motivate okay. me? Okay. A little bit, a little bit tricksy there, eh? Yeah. You know, and it's like, you know, I obviously I'd be like, you know, maybe you, know, you obviously haven't been as active either. Maybe it'll help both of us. And then I'd start playing that angle, <laughs> but it has to start off with, it's my problem. My idea, will you help me? And then, okay. and then. You know, let's say you're taking initiative and it's not being reciprocated. 
maybe you could address it a little bit more head on at that point. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, especially being a a heterosexual male having to approach a woman's emotions, I feel like being a woman having to approach a, you know, vice versa, it might be differently. And uh, that's just kind of how I would do it is I don't see any success coming at it like, hey, honey, getting a little thick around the hips. You know, I... I, (laughs) I love having stuff to grab onto, but I wasn't thinking love handles, uh, you know, so I, I, that might not be the best way. Yeah, that definitely would not be the best way. It might. You never know, though. <laughs> and the honesty might be they say they want honesty, right? Yeah. So why wouldn't honesty be the best policy? I, right? <laughs> right? 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 You want us to be honest? <laughs> yeah. You're just getting a little hefty. You need to start exercising. I think working out with me compared to you need to work out is an extremely important distinction. It is. A, it's a like good those one. Those three little words change the whole message. Do you want to go to the gym with me? It's the much easier way to get this started. Then you need to go to the gym. Yeah. That's an extremely different statement. Yeah. <laughs> extremely different statement. Well, there's, I think there's a lot of things that could, could happen in terms of your conversation of like the quality of food that you'll eat, you know, things like that. I was what, what you guys say, buy at groceries. That probably is more an effect than you doing know, going grocery shopping food. together would be a good, good, you know, instance or something like that, because, you know, she may be buying stuff that you're like, why are you buying, you know, these cheese crackers every, every time you go to the grocery stores, you know, you're not going to eat them if you don't have them, whatever it is, and just doesn't get them Honest, there or helps her make better choices on food. I think grocery things. shopping together is a, a huge thing. I was just thing. about to say, I don't think you'd have to be as sneaky about it, but if, if you're actually dealing with that sort of issue, that's what I would do. Yeah. I mean, Susie is, is tiny, so I need to make her gain weight. So I get double stuff Oreos all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to, she's not going to be gaining weight through the gym. Like she needs to be eating more crap. <laughs> like, but some people need the opposite. And I think as far as just straight weight, you're going to make a lot bigger difference if you put down, you know, the Oreos or you pick them up. That's going to do a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the grocery store thing is probably number one step mm-hmm. in that. Because realistically, if, if this is your partner or spouse or significant other, majority of the time you, you're not you know, blame free in this whatsoever. Yeah. So I think coming at an approach like, Hey, you have the problem you need to fix this. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, just, I would, just because you find them like fat doesn't mean that they find themselves fat. So it, it's only a problem to you. So unless you're willing to make that effort to, I guess, uh, be their partner with it and, and you know, be a, taken on as a journey. I feel like that's the best way to approach it. There is an interesting phenomenon that happens, you know, especially whenever you start, like I saw this more frequently because I was training clients that they looked normal for a long time. They worked out, you know, but they just looked normal. And then all of a sudden they got serious and they were going to make results and they, they did, you know, and so they lost a bottle of body fat, they gained muscle, they looked completely different. And all of a sudden they get this ego boost uh, for themselves and like a like I'm better than other people because I plan my meals out and I work out and I look better than you and things. And it actually, there's a lot of times where it causes a rift in the relationship between the two because they both used to be kind of fat. And now one of them looks really good and he thinks he's better than her Mm -hmm. and that, or she thinks that she's better than him whenever she gets in shape, you know, and that has caused probably more of the fitness related divorces Mm -hmm. and cheating than probably anything else that I could imagine is some sort of a, you know, hmm. ego boost or something. So I would say, you know, on the opposite hand, if you are the lady that is in denial and does not want to go to the gym or be healthy or the guy, whoever it is, right? And uh, if you're the one that doesn't want to change, you also have to remember that, like, this is this is a two-way street. Like, you are here because, you know, of your relationship. So you should want to, you know, make the other person happy. You know, you should want to look good for the other person, things like that. If it's a real problem and they're coming to you, I think there there should be some sort of uh, understanding on the person that's getting getting the conversation, you know, brought to them as well. See, sure. the, his takeaway from that, mine are completely different. His takeaway was, you know, if you don't want them to leave you, you better work out. Mine was, if you start working out, they might leave you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think both things are true. I think uh, human beings are wildly insecure. For yeah. sure. You get into this realm. It's probably a tinge of something there normally, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. You can have bad motivation, good motivation. True. So what's what's worse? Okay. In your guys' opinion, hypothetically, you're with your significant other. You guys get in shape and she gets an ego boost and leaves you. Mm-hmm. Or you guys end up splitting up and then she gets super in shape and hot after you. Yeah. <laughs> which, would, which would be worse? The, the Probably the cheating is worse. 
Yeah, I would probably go with the emotional damage of yeah. the, the cheating. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I never said cheating. I just said leaves you. Oh, you said leave you. Uh, okay. I just assumed I'm that. just talking to ego boots and just like, ah. Uh, like, okay, yeah. okay. Neither one's going to feel very nice. Uh, I mean, I would assume that if you guys split and she didn't leave you, that you were just like also cool with not having her anymore. Yeah. And that you'd probably be like, yeah, she looks great, but like she's a crazy fucking weirdo. Yeah, you know? I'm not gonna lie, I, don't like, really... I wouldn't, I wouldn't sacrifice anything to be with that crazy bitch again. You know, whatever <laughs> yeah. it is. I don't, I don't really like. I feel like in some ways the revenge body whole like social media narrative is actually like admitting that you were wrong. <laughs> like if if you have to get into the gym and be like, I'm gonna get in great shape because that woman was really mean to me. It's like, dude. You yeah. you probably messed this up, or if this chick's like he's you know he doesn't deserve me at my best, like he's not going to give me my words, you know, like the vice, whatever it is, and she just goes in the gym and takes pictures of her ass for three months. Like, dude, I think you won there. Yeah, like like you're you won. So yeah, I think getting left is the worst. You know, I'll say that. I just think getting left, especially if it was out of nowhere. I think she, you know this girl gets in great shape and she's like, well. Like, hell yeah, my investment's finally starting to pay off. You were, you were good for the time of life before I made it. Now I've made it, so I no longer want you. I think that's that's probably the worst one out of it. Definitely not the one. No, it's, it's a blessing in disguise. That's kind of what I'm saying. Is, uh, I'm out of lucked out if she's, she gets, like, if she's that obsessed with it. Or he, for the matter. True. I know tons of dudes that are like care way too much about how they look. Very, I don't very know true. why women get that stereotype. We're in the fitness thing. I... I see and deal with way more dudes that care about how they look than women. Yeah, it's just different aspects for the most yeah, part. Yeah, but it's, they, they all but they care how they look. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a. I don't know. I I always I always enjoy it when you see people on social media that you were in like long relationships and you just see them like hitting the gym or then mm-hmm. get like a gym bro boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's the the natural progression. It's I've seen it so many times. It's <laughs> it's amazing. I think it works for some people and other people. I don't. I know there's tons of dudes that like lifting and their girlfriends do cardio, so they go together, but they don't even like see each other at the gym. No, so I don't think you have to. I don't think you together. have to both be into the same thing by yeah. any means. I don't think if if you're a bodybuilder that your your wife needs to be a bodybuilder totally, or like yeah. anything like that, or if she's a bodybuilder, I don't think that he needs to be. And for the record, just to put a bow on that conversation, I still think it's really easy. I'm not a bodybuilder, obviously, but I would imagine there's plenty of bodybuilders with totally normal wives that don't even go to the gym. Yeah, completely. And same they probably with women. Yeah, they like, don't care. Yeah, there's, I bet you know. there's plenty of people like that. Yeah. I think there's like a, a stigma or an assumption that if you're in killer shape, you have to have somebody else that's in killer that's shape. That's what I mean. That's true. Yeah, I just don't think that's true. I think there are people that will hold that as like, that's their point of pride, though. Like the fact that they're in such great shape means they deserve somebody else that's in such great shape. Sure. And so, and you will find these people in the fitness industry that will only go after these other people that are in great shape that look like them. And, you know, they're probably miserable people. And so, and so <laughs> they're probably, their relationships won't last and they're probably miserable people. So that's all I have to say about that. Don't well, be shallow. Sounds like a, a good way to wrap this up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you made it this far. If you made it this far. Nut Club promo code twenty percent off first time purchase. Yeah, if you've never tried the Nutri Thirty supplements, these beauties right here, you can use coupon code Put Nut Club at checkout for twenty percent off for your first purchase. Peppermint Mocha, look at that! It's the holiday season. Get in, get in the holiday cheer with so Peppermint Christmas Mocha. Time. It's the perfect blend of peppermint, coffee, and chocolate together. So it's it's peppermint, chocolate, and coffee. You could spend peppermint seven dollars a a trip at the drive thru at Starbucks, or you could just, just get do, you a beautiful nice two pound tub of it you know scoops yep 30 scoops well delightful yep (laughs) enjoy thank you for uh watching the nut club everybody thanks for cranking one out with the nut club see y'all next week uh r.i.p richie we'll put up the gofundme for his uh, expenses in a little bit for trash by the way (laughs) richie richie will be here next week (laughs) should be three and five